All right, well, good morning. Looks like we're missing a number of people, but also knowing this class, they tend to roll in around 8.40ish. But we're going to get started as close to on time as possible this morning because we kind of have a long ways to go this morning, and I want to make sure we, we get there. Um, but hey, it, it is good to be back. Um, I want to thank you for the guys that subbed in for me for the last couple of weeks while I was in the pulpit for the pastor. Um, but he is back, so everything's back to normal. We're in a new year, and as you can see, we are starting a brand new series that I think that a lot of you may not have been through in the past. Uh, the book of Ecclesiastes is it one that a lot of people go to, minus chapter 3, because that made it into a popular song back in the 70s. Um, <laughs> but other than that, people kind of tend to grab a verse here or there and then go on. And, and what we're going to find is there, and as the title of the series, is, well, that's not up there, but it's on your paper, is The Well-Lived Life. And in, in 2022, with, with 2020 and 2021 in our rearview mirrors and the dramatic changes it's made, I think everybody's kind of looking for how to have that well-lived life. So that's what, that's what we're going to see over the next about three months, the next 12 weeks. So without any further ado, Cindy, would you open us this morning? Ecclesiastes, there's a term that, you know, doesn't get banged around a bunch. Every once in a while you'll hear it, an ecclesiastical um, event, that sort of thing. Anybody know what Ecclesiastes, just the word, means? It's, it's very simple. It simply means preacher. Yep. So kind of take, giving yourself a little more modern language in there, you can say this is, this is the preacher. Um, now, in for the book of Ecclesiastes, in particular, if you go online and, or you do something in your own study, there's there's some argument as to the writing of it, whether or not Solomon is the author. I will tell you right now, I'm in the camp that Solomon is. The argument against it basically gets to down to some linguistics, and there's a couple of words in the book of Ecclesiastes that weren't in common use as far as people that are trying to trace history and, and verbiage for some time later. So they say, okay, then that Solomon couldn't have possibly written this because this word is in here and it wasn't in common use until this time. But that's always kind of a, a very difficult way to date anything because unless you're there, you're, you don't know. And we also know that Solomon was the most learned man out there. Um, he was obviously very well versed in ancient Mesopotamian and Egyptian writings. Some of that shows up, but not in the later classical Greek writings that came out, which as learned as he was, he probably would have definitely, you know, accessed some of that as well. So they like said that argument's out there. I want you to kind of know it up front, but I, I am teaching from the, the more traditional view that Solomon is our writer. Um, and there's some obviously evidences that we're going to see right off the get-go this morning. Now, he identifies himself with this name, Quel, Quoleth, Quoleth, which means teacher. So the, the Hebrew term is Quoleth, and that's more of a title name than a, a common name like Sam or Bill. But he calls himself Quoleth, or the teacher. So, and he gives us some additional information as he's the son of David and king in Jerusalem. So right off the get-go, he tells us, hey, this is who I am. I am the teacher. I am Koaleth. But he's not writing as the king. So this isn't a decree. This isn't something you have to do. He's writing as a teacher. He's giving advice 
and he's reflecting on things that he's learned. So he's trying to impart information, whereas a king doesn't impart information. He tells you what it is, <laughs> what you're going to do, what you're not going to do. It's written in the later years of Solomon's life, and amongst other things, it contains a warning to avoid walking through life on the path of human wisdom, which is very good warning, because human wisdom just doesn't cut it over time. Actually, not for any part. Instead, what we're going to see over the course of this study is that he wants us to live by the revealed wisdom of God. Something that you can actually kind of take to the bank. Because human wisdom tends to change. Those of you that are in your 60s and 70s, or 80s, how much has, of human wisdom has changed over the course of your lifetime? Things that you knew were true, and then turned out, no, no, no. <laughs> or this is the way you do things, and now, no. What we're going, to, we're going to see in this study also one particular word, and depending upon your particular translation, the word vanity. And it means vapor or breath. If you were, I was out here earlier this morning I, I came in to make the coffee and whatnot so if it's too strong sorry if it's too weak tell me and I'll, I'll bump it up <laughs> um, my coffee generally if you stir it with a spoon and leave it and the spoon stays standing that's coffee yes. for other people they want lightly browned water <laughs> but when I came in this morning as I got out of my car every time I exhaled I could see my breath typical of good winter morning that's the idea of what of vanity. That's what the word means. Um, it's used on a in at least three different ways to examine man's activity. So even though it means breath, it's going to have kind of three different sub meanings. The first is that things are fleeting. Well, and when you exhale out on a cold morning and you see your breath, how long is it there? Yeah. You know, a second or two, and then gone. This really encompasses the vapor-like nature of life. And the writer James in the New Testament has the same idea. In fact, let's just get in Scripture right off this morning. Somebody want to look up James chapter 4, verse 14. Not good. Go ahead. Okay. For as ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life, it is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. Yep, so James has that exact same idea. You know, he says, what's your life? It's like a vapor. It's there and then it's gone. Even if, like Miss Ruth, it lasts for 96 years. And I, I loved the, the, the slide montage and looking at the pictures, if you were there for the, for the service, of some of the old days here in Levine and people in their overalls and wood plank houses and whatnot as they were trying to make Levine into something. But then it's gone. And James comes up with that exact same idea echoing, echoing Psalms. So that's one of the ideas is that of vanity is that things are fleeting. Another idea is that, it's, that things are futile or meaningless. Here's a real focus on the absolutely cursed condition of the universe and the completely debilitating effects that it has on man's earthly experience. The third idea of vanity is things are incomprehensible. And this particularly is in, in focus on life's unanswerable questions. And it's usually when things are going really sour or odd things happen that we begin to ask those questions. How, why? How come? And so this idea of vanity incorporates all three of those, but it'll kind of flow to one or more of those as we come to ind individual verses and every time he ends up using it. So fleeting, futile, or incomprehensible, that's all in that idea of vanity every time he uses it. Um, and like I said, depending on your 
your uh, translation, it, it may say futility or it may use the word meaningless. But again, I like to define terms because if I don't, <coughs> then I throw a term out and I have 32 people with 32 ideas of, of what a word means. Now, crises, crises or crises <laughs> tends to cause questions, don't they? When you're in crisis, when things go really sideways, it tends to have you formulate a bunch of questions. When our life is good, when everything's going well, the really big questions in our life are, you know, where am I going to spend my, my entire paycheck? Wow. Or where will our vacation be this year? And of course, the really big question in life when things are going well. Where are we eating tonight? <laughs> Mine is when will the other shoe drop? Yeah. Well, that's a whole other one. There, I saw a thing on, on uh, somebody sent it to me, and somebody was proposing a new app for married couples. And it was kind of like a, a tender thing where you swipe left or swipe right. And in this new app, it would bring up every restaurant within it, whatever range you set it in, like within a 20 mile range. And then the two of you would look at it, and as you swipe, the, you keep swiping left or right, as you swipe left, the first time the two of you swipe left, is that the correct way? People that are under 30, you swipe left or swipe right. I never know which way. I'm gonna go with left. If you, the first time you both swipe left and you pick the same restaurant, that's where you're going. <laughs> But yeah, yeah, I looked at it and said, you know, you know. Um, but those are the big questions in life when everything's going well. But when we're in crisis, all of a sudden there's all kinds of other questions come up. When we face those really tough tests of terminal illness, the tough questions of death, divorce, bankruptcy, even midlife malaise, the, the classic, what they call the midlife crisis. And suddenly the questions all change. As we look in the book of Ecclesiastes, the reader, Ecclesiastes tells the reader how to live in the world as it really is instead of living in a world of false hope. Instead of a world of false ideas and yeah. The book urges its readers to recognize that they are mortal and they have to abandon all illusions of self-importance. Facing death and life squarely, except with fear and trembling, their dependence on God. I really think we're going to see three conclusions by the end of this study. The first is all pretense of pride in oneself has to be abandoned. Yeah, I can. Or as Frank Sinatra saying, I did it my, my way. way. And of course, again, if you've been in my Sunday school class for any amount of time, we know that the core root of all sin is what? Pride. pride. Absolutely. And every sin you can name has pride somewhere in its, in its DNA. The second, well, yeah, the second one is that life should be enjoyed for what it is, which is a gift of God. And life should be enjoyed. God gave you this gift of life. And he didn't give it to you so you can just walk around. <laughs> so... I think we're going to see that while we shouldn't consider pleasure to be the goal of life, we shouldn't miss those fleeting joys in life either. This really is an admission that one's work here isn't as important as one might wish, because it really doesn't have eternal validity, unless of course it's work for the kingdom. It's also an antidote, really, for that quest for wealth. Ecclesiastes is an antidote for the health and wealth preachers out there. And the supposed pleasure that health 
or that wealth brings, as personal happiness and the enjoyment of life's pleasures are often the cost of obtaining them. And the third, and I think, and I would postulate is the most important conclusion that we're going to get to by the time this, our study is over, is that we must revere God because to refuse to do so is to deny one's dependency on God in the first place. And then all of a sudden, enjoyment of what God has given me becomes a much easier concept to deal with. And everything that God has given me. Whether on a, from a human standpoint, we consider it a good or a bad thing. So, with all that kind of background and, and set to the, the book of Ecclesiastes, if you have your Bible, let's open up into it and get right into um, this. And before we, I do, um, with the two gentlemen that have the, the uh, outlines, hand those out. I'm handing out an outline of the book of Ecclesiastes. Now, you will find, if you go online, a number of different outlines, depending upon who's looked at it, who's written it. This is just the one I like. There is no, oh, this is the holy one. <laughs> this is just the one that I prefer. So this is the one I'm giving you. So you can hold on to this for the entire, the entire study or put it in your personal notes, um, fold it up, put it in your Bible next to Ecclesiastes, whatever. I just, I just like this particular outline of the book. Oh, and before I go much further, uh, let's welcome back Paul and Melinda. You know, Texas finally had to give them back up. <laughs> they gave up on us. <laughs> How they seceded from the union. <laughs> <laughs> you should have been there in the Alamore case. They need to check. <laughs> All right, so I so said we're into the book of Ecclesiastes. Well, let's look at the introduction and theme that the writer Quoleth gives us right in the first two verses. Somebody want to read the first two verses, Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, the introduction and the theme. Sure. Go ahead. So the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, vanity of vanities, says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Yeah. What a great opening. Okay, <laughs> closing the book. I, I want to go read something positive. Yes. Yeah. Now, we've already discussed who the author is, so let's look a little more at the theme, although you can see who he gives idea who the author is. He says he's the son of David, and he's the king in Jerusalem. Well, that kind of pretty much points it directly to Solomon, because David had a bunch of sons, but only one of them became king in Jerusalem. So when you read vanity, vanity, or futility, or meaningless, again, depending upon which translation you're reading from, what he's getting at is that things are not as much ephemeral. Ooh, there's a college word. Yes, it is. Which means kind of ghost-like, mist-like. It's that everything is absurd. So this is just nuts. Basically, if we took it into modern English, you'd go, this is crazy. Yeah. This makes no sense. Everything makes no sense. Great opening. That makes you want to read the book. <laughs> His idea is that injustice is contrary to the world, how the world should operate. As he's looked around and studied, he says, you know what? There's injustice everywhere. And that's not how it should be. Everybody agree with him so far? Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, we've had entire marches and mostly peaceful demonstrations and all kinds of stuff on injustice. And Solomon, hundreds, thousands of years ago, looked at that and said the same thing. You know, injustice is, is how the world should operate, but that's not what I'm seeing. This should be the moral order of things. <coughs> so he's even seeing his position in society as injustice, too. Well, yes. 
Everything. Yeah, the, the everything. He's in a position of the highest authority in the land, and he sees that as an injustice. Yeah, but think that everyone else around him. Yeah, yeah, that things just aren't right. The dictates of wisdom and reason aren't the sure guides that the world and the world itself is very warped and capricious. It just kind of is here, and then it's there, and it's over here, and it doesn't make any sense. So vanity of vanities. There's, there's that idea of futility, and things are just absurd. Doesn't make any sense. Anybody felt that way as you've gone through life? This doesn't make any sense. How come? So welcome to the world of Solomon thousands of years ago. That should be a little comforting in that you're not just rediscovering the idea that this world is nuts. <laughs> that the most well-versed man ever on the planet looked at it and said, no, and things really haven't changed. Everything is transitory. As he looks at it, he realizes nothing stays. And therefore, it's of no lasting value. If it's not going to be permanent, why bother? People essentially are caught in the trap of the absurd and are constantly striving after these empty pleasures. Essentially, they build their lives on lies. If I just do this, I'll be happy. If I just obtain this, then I'll be happy. Okay, I'm there. Wait, whoops, I'm not happy. Okay, if I just, and we keep moving the goalpost. And Solomon says, this is just nuts. This is dumb. He had all the wealth, he had all the knowledge, and he realized none of that means anything. Because as soon as he died, where did all of his knowledge and wealth go? So that's his introduction. <laughs> that's just his theme. And now we're going to unpack it over, over the next couple of three months. So let's pick up on, on the biggest part of chapter one, which is the passing of time and the world. So I need somebody with a nice good reading because you've got a bunch of verses. You've got eight verses to read. Ch uh, chapter one, verses three through 11. Go ahead. What does man gain from all his labor at which he toils under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south and turns to the north. Round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. All streams flow into the sea, and yet the sea is never full. To the place the streams come from, there they return again. All things are wearisome, more than one can say. The eye never has enough of seeing, nor the ear is filled of hearing. And what has been will be again, and what has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new. It was here already long ago. It was here before our time. There is no remembrance of men of old, and even those who are yet to come, not be remembered by those who follow. Pessimistic. <laughs> so the big question that he poses there in those eight verses is what do we get out of constantly working? What is the point of going through all of the stuff that we go through? As he looks at these never-ending cycles that don't produce anything. When it, with the word, we read the word profit there. Profit is just that in a business sense. I have my cost, I have what I sell it for, and the difference is the profit. He said, Look, I have my cost of my life, I have what I work, but at the end, there's no profit. There's nothing left over. There's nothing that lasts. Man, I look back at, we say, oh, what, this is brand 
If you study history, you realize that nothing we're going through is new. Y'all know the cancel culture isn't new, right? Not even close. Probably in more recent amount of history, go back and read a little event called the French Revolution. Now, when they canceled you, they flat took your head. But all somebody had to do was denounce somebody, cancel culture, and then bring them in, and here we go. Yes? When you get out of work, it is a home. You do, but then, but, but what does that last? What does that last? Well, temporary. Yeah. About the time you pay it off, you have to completely rebuild the thing. So, yeah, he looks at that. Yeah, you do get temporary stuff, but he's looking at what is going to last. What permanence is that? It's not a matter of that we shouldn't work, but it, work should not be our goal and our everything and our, our yeah, that's, drive. It's there to sustain us during this time, but this, that's not the ultimate win. No, and we're, and we're going to see that as we, as, we go, as we go through the book. At, at the summation of life, when life is done, whether it's 96 years or, or like that young man funeral we had before Pastor Lepp, I think he was 16 Seven. or 17. Yeah. At, the, at the end, the, nobody can show a net gain. The transitory nature of human generations contrasts with the permanence and apparent immutability of the physical world. The physical world is just there, keeps repeating, keeps going, but our generations come and go. My wife's great aunt Ruth, who recently passed, 96, was the last of a generation in the Cheatham world. There was four brothers, four wives, and they had kids, and, and then Cheatham's went, you know. But she was the last. And now it's gone. And that's, he looks at that transitory nature. No one has changed the course of nature. No one. Hold on to that climate change folks. No one has changed the course of nature. I love man's pride to think that he can change the course of nature. I'm old enough to remember when we were having global cooling. And the entire news cycle was freaked out that the ice sheets were going to come down as far as southern Colorado. And they were going to have to put black tarps out on the ice to try and heat it up and melt it. It's in my lifetime. And now it's, oh, global warming, we're all going to die. Man's arrogance and pride never ceases to amaze me. But nobody has changed the course of nature. Generations come and go as a part of nature's cycles. And this has been seen by writers in every culture and time. Um, those of you in, in high school that had to read Homer's Iliad. Anybody? Here's a quote from the Iliad. The race of man is as the race of leaves. Of leaves, one generation by the wind is scattered on the earth, another soon in spring's luxuriant verdure, verdure bursts to light. So with our race, these flourish, those decay. So see, Solomon wasn't the only one to kind of look at that and realize. Some things are fixed, he writes, and some things aren't. And he gives two examples, the sun and the wind. He says the sun comes up, it sets, and then races to get back. Of course, they were still of the idea that the sun was busy circling the earth. And then races to get back to its point to do it again. But he said the wind is something totally different. It blows out of the south, and then it blows out of the north. Then it comes this way, and it goes that way, and then ends up coming around and seemingly without any purpose. I think the great song from Fiddler on the Roof, Sunrise, Sunset, echoes in a very mournful song that as well. Now, in that particular musical, in that song, it's, it's mourning the, the passing of time with with your children and them 
not being little and then growing up and going off, but yet it, here's that transitory nature of everything as well. I had some of most of my kids home for Christmas. My college daughter who's finishing up her master's was home. She was home until Friday. She was home for a couple weeks. Um, but I came in, made the cops this morning, went back, and as I pulled around onto my street, her truck was gone. I go, rotten kid. <laughs> <laughs> but she had to go back home. She's starting class on Monday. She's teaching, I think, eight courses there at, at CBU while while taking her own master's courses. And all of a sudden, yeah, that transitory nature. Did you just say goodbye? Yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. She, she left on Friday. Oh, yeah. She left on Friday. And lots of goodbyes. <laughs> Mrs. E just misses her when she's gone. <laughs> she torments him. But torments me complete, <laughs> constantly. <laughs> Rotten kid. And then says, Dad, remember, I, I need tuition money. <laughs> <laughs> In verse 7, the sense of accomplishing nothing is really reinforced. All the streams flow to the sea, yet the sea is never full. The streams are flowing to the place, and they flow there again. That whole water cycle, right there in, in the book of Ecclesiastes. Rivers flow into the sea, but the sea doesn't fill up. It just recycles back to the rivers and does it all over again. I think California, last I heard, has 135% of their usual snowpack. And they're constantly in water crisis over there, so that's a good thing. And hopefully we'll get some more before, you know, winter is done. Solomon seems to be seeing a couple of things here. The first is that there's a real sense of influenced by the universe as to our presence, our real indifference. The universe doesn't care that you're here. What? <laughs> Do you know who I am? And the universe doesn't care? Nope. I'm thinking about going teaching this to a Gen Z class. <laughs> Universe doesn't care about you at all. <laughs> or your influence. Or what you think. It was here before we came, and it's going to continue after we leave until the book of Revelation takes hold and God says, okay, enough is enough. That's a very sobering thought, really. The universe doesn't care about you. You're not at the center of it. And it's going to continue right on chugging along, whether you're here or not. The second one is that, however, the universe itself is trapped in this cycle of monotonous and meaningless repetition and motion and doing it again and again and again. To what end? Really, there's a sense of loneliness and abandonment, I think, that pervades the text here as I read it. Paul described this well in that creation is subject to frustration, bondage to decay, and awaiting freedom. Romans chapter 8, verses 19 to 21 says this. For the creation eagerly waits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. The creation eagerly waits. I talked about eagerly last Wednesday night, if you were here, as we were looking forward. And it eagerly waits with anticipation for God's son to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to futility. There's that same concept. The creation was subject to vanity. Not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in the hope that the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage of corruption into the glorious freedom of God's children. So as Solomon looks at it, and then Paul looks at it again and says, yeah, this is, what, this is where, where it's at.
In the next verse, in, in verse 8, he says that all things, therefore, are, are wearisome. I love that terminology. I'm just weary. I'm just, I'm just tired of it all. All right, again, how many of you have had days like that where you say, you know what? I'm just tired of it all. Of doing it again and again and again. And I empty the laundry basket, and darn if my husband doesn't change his clothes and fill it up again. <laughs> and then I have to make, then we have to make another meal. And then if we have to make another meal, then we've got to clean the dishes. And, then, and here runs, it runs, and I gotta go to work. And it's the same thing, and the same customers, and they're complaining again. And blah, 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 blah. He says the eyes and ears stand, the eye, he mentioned the eyes and ears, and they basically stand in for all five of our senses. And even though our knowledge continues to increase, and our knowledge over the last few decades has increased exponentially, but even though it increases, our understanding of the whys of everything are left completely unfulfilled in the natural setting. We still ask the big whys. Why? Why did, why did that 16-year-old boy die? Why is there COVID? Why? Of course, I addressed that in a series of, of big questions about a year, year and a half ago on those seven big questions. Why, if God is a good God... And we're, we, we end up in those, those big whys. Because everything is wearisome. I just do it again and again and again. And then one day I die, and what is the prophet? In verses 9 through 11, the teacher gives another implication of the, in the description of the world. He says, what has been will be again. Man, if you are not a student of history, you are missing out. I know some of you, I hate history. Ah! Well, I hated some parts of it too. I hated knowing that, you know, the Battle of Hastings happened in, I don't care <laughs> about that. I don't care about a date. Some historians, my son is a big history guy. Fact is, and military history, he's accumulating authentic uniforms of every era in American history. And he has several already that he's put together. And his hope is one day, as he ends his police career, to go in and teach history, and he will put on these various uniforms because they're all made to, to fit him. He has revolutionary soldier and all this stuff. But again, it's not the dates, it's what happened in history. What did people do? And I love that currently we are delving with, in America, history of one little particular part, part of time and removing history, every piece of history that happened before that. Yes. Because again, if you study history, you see, okay, this is, a, this is a cycle and this is a people thing that's happened again and again and again and again and is still happening today. Solomon realized that. He said, what has been will be again. He looked around and said, okay, what is new out there? And he said, there's absolutely nothing new. There is nothing new here today, folks. You can't point me to anything happening in our culture and society that is new. Some of it looks a little different, how we go about it. Somebody said, well, blasting off into space, that's new. Yes. But traveling into places you've never been before isn't. Sailing, getting in a little wooden boat and heading west to see what's out there across the ocean when some people thought it was flat, which makes no sense to me because where did all the water go? But anyway, that's a scary proposition. So there's nothing new. Things look a little different, but there's nothing new. Cars, computers, jet airplanes have made some things easier and faster, but nothing has altered life's, how life progresses and what comes out of it. Because what comes out of it? 
uh, that would be death. That would be you live for a while, maybe you have a house, maybe you don't. Maybe you have a husband, maybe you don't. Maybe you have a wife, maybe you don't. Maybe you have kids, maybe you don't. Maybe you have a good paying job, maybe you don't. But at the end, the outcome is all the same. Like I already said, cancel culture isn't new. See, French, see the French Revolution. And in particular, if you really want to kind of get into a little history, look at a little person, and Cindy brought this up to me the other day, by the name of Robespierre. He was one of the big guys in the French Revolution cancel culture. And just like every cancel culture, do you know what ended up happening to Robespierre? He got canceled. He got canceled. <laughs> in the same way that he was canceling all the other folks because eventually somebody then denounced him so just like our own cancel culture ends up eating its own thank you it's happened before oh absolutely it just it's a cycle and solomon realized this is a cycle people group to people group it happens again and again and again the vast majority of people don't achieve lasting fame, and those who do don't profit from it in any lasting sense. In a temporary sense, fame will bring you something, but in a lasting sense, you know what? I'm going to be on an absolute par with Solomon, with George Washington, with Martin Luther King Jr. I'm going to, at the end of my life, I'm going to be on an absolute even par with all of them. Oh. Yes. <laughs> I was going to say, in our own life, right, we had a major uh, uh, canceling culture cancel, uh, in the early 50s. Remember the McCarthy uh, hearings? Oh, yeah, yeah, with, with the, 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 uh, the communist yeah. stuff. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. no, again. Well, not your time, but my time. <laughs> now, this is not a contradiction to the gospel. In fact, is I see it as a call for the gospel. The world is in bondage, and humanity is unable to explain it, to find satisfaction in it, to alter it in any way which leads, and then that leads to frustration and hopelessness, because I can't change anything in this world. I'm frustrated and I'm hopeless. What's the answer to that? That would be the gospel. The gospel. Actually, Solomon would have been forgotten had he not been in the Bible that the Lord chose to preserve through the years. Mm -hmm. He'd have been just like the rest of Like them. all the other kings that came and went, unless you happen to dig up something with a stone that has his name on it, you go, hmm, gone. Yeah. Only the word, and the word I'm using with the capital W, the name, who came into the world can open the way of understanding and escape. Somebody want to read John chapter 8, because John refused or views Jesus as and calls him the Word. John chapter 8, verses 23, and then skip down to verses 31 and 32. Anybody? John chapter 8, verse 23, and then 31 and 32. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. John chapter 8, verse 23. Jesus continued, You are from below, I am from above. You belong to this world, I do not. And then 31, 31 and 32. 32. Jesus said to the people who believed in him, You are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Yeah, one of the most misquoted scriptures. Yes, yes. yes. And then it, when you put it back in context, you realize that Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then this quote comes out. So the truth he's referring to, the truth that will set you free, is knowing Jesus. So there is a way of understanding and escape. And Jesus says, I'm in because I'm not a part of this never-ending cycle world. In fact, as John 1.1 1, 1 says that the word is the reason that this world exist in the first place. So and in that text, we could capitalize the truth to give it the same meaning as Jesus. Yeah, really. Absolutely. Absolutely. If you know Jesus, then you know Jesus. The you truth. know the truth. Yes. And that's what will now take you out of this never-ending, meaningless cycle. See, 
he has done, Jesus has done the new thing that Solomon was looking for. What did Solomon say? What is new under the sun? Nothing. Nothing. Jesus, who's not a part of this, came into it, and he is that new thing that Solomon was looking for. This is something new. This is different. This is something that's never happened before. This is outside of that continuous circle of meaninglessness. He has done that new thing. Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 to 34. Look, the days are coming. This is the Lord's declaration. When I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, this one will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant they broke, even though I had married them, the Lord's declaration. Instead, this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days. The Lord's, I will place my law within them. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. There's the new thing that Solomon was looking for. Something that is not a part of that continuous cycle that changes the dynamics of everything. So see, all of this doom and gloom stuff that is there is not a contradiction to the gospel. It's a call to get into the gospel and see what the gospel does. And Jesus says, I'm not a part of this world, and I'm bringing in a new covenant. Solomon said, there's nothing new, and he was right. If I look at the natural world, there's nothing new. Everything just cycles around until Jesus, or that one of my favorite phrases, but God, <laughs> but God said, okay, here's something new. Here's a change to that never ending <coughs> worthless cycle. He has a new name. He has given the new birth, new life, new commandment, a new name that will last forever. And everything old is, everything else is old and just passing away. Thoughts? What do you think so far? Well, I really like in Jeremiah how he uses the word instead. It helps us understand this is a replacement. That mm -hmm. It really can be put to sleep. The, the, old, the old law, for instance, and you really can look at it from a new... Even though somehow, in the same, in the same breath, nothing changes, right? God doesn't change. God's uh, nature doesn't change. His will for us never changed. But his, his plan for us, and the steps and actions we're going to take, can change now. And it, re but it required something new to step into that cycle, to break that cycle, and say, okay, I need something new. I need, I need something because otherwise, this world just keeps doing its thing. Solomon recognized that, and I need that new thing to happen. How many of you so far have been able to really read along with Solomon and go, yep, <laughs> yep. That's my life right there. He just, <laughs> he just laid it all out. I'm always in shock of people who say, oh, the Old Testament. What a worthless stuff. There's this angry God in there. And there's death and destruction. No, there's absolutely truth. And I can go in there and look at and read it. We've been through a few books of the Old Testament together. And say, you know what? I can see me right there. I can see my life right there. Yeah, I'm not living in with oil lamps and you know sheep living in the one room of my house and stuff, which is good. I just get to go to the market. I don't have to know the sheep personally. It's just in a nice cellophane package. I can put it on the grill. <laughs> Yeah. But the essential elements of life, Solomon describes in perfection. Describes my life, describes your life absolutely in perfection. So now, all of a sudden, he has our undivided attention because we realize that if Solomon is recognizing this, and I can recognize this, and we have this absolute connection here, okay, where are we going to go from here? 
He closes out chapter one with kind of a, now a treatise on wisdom. And Solomon is known as what? The wisest, the wisest man, right, to ever live. So let's get into that, that last part of wisdom. So some, let's go back to Ecclesiastes chapter one, verses 12 through 18. Go ahead. I, the preacher, have been king over Israel and Jerusalem. Hold up right there again. So now you see he names himself again. Again, this is why I am a Solomon writer of this, because twice in the first chapter he's identified himself as king in, in, in Jerusalem. Go ahead. And I set my mind to seek and explore by wisdom concerning all that has been done under heaven. It is a grievous task which God has given to the sons of men to be afflicted with. I have seen all the works which have been done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and striving after wind. What is crooked cannot be straightened, and what is lacking cannot be counted. I said to myself, behold, I have magnified and increased wisdom more than all who were over Jerusalem before me, and my mind has observed the wealth of wisdom and knowledge. And I set my mind to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I realized that this also is striving after wind. Because in much wisdom there is much grief. And increasing knowledge results in, in increasing pain. Oh, what a happy ending. <laughs> 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 yeah. So he identifies himself as Quaholeth again, the teacher. And again, he reminds the reader that he's the king. But then he tells them that he put all of his effort into studying and getting wisdom. He didn't just say, okay, God has granted me wisdom. He said, I'm going after it. I'm going to get everything that I can. Now, wisdom, this idea of wisdom in Hebrew thought is more practical than philosophical. Wisdom, is, knowledge is knowledge. It's just that. Okay, 2 plus 2 is 4. That's a fact. It's, knowledge is facts. Wisdom is being able to take facts and make it useful. So it's not philosophical, it's practical. How does, how does knowledge become a useful commodity? And it, it implies a lot more than just simple, simple knowledge. It carries the idea of the ability for proper behavior. If I'm wise, I can take facts and now act correctly. Parents, sound like anything you tried to teach your children? <laughs> okay, here's the fact. Now, here's how you can act properly. It also has the idea of success, of common sense, and even wit. The, the Hebraic idea of wisdom encompasses more than just knowledge. How, do, how does knowledge become practical? Common sense. You're going to be successful because you're taking knowledge and applying it correctly. And now, yeah, I do this, and now I, it works, and water flows, and I make money, I eat well, whatever. And even having a good wit about you, you know, being, being quick. His opinion, though, <laughs> is that wisdom is a really lousy job. And it's, it's been given to him by God. And he said, you know, this stinks. But he asked for it. Yeah. It was him who asked for the wisdom. Yeah. But now he's an old man and he's thinking, you know, can I, can I go back and get a, another request, God? Because this one didn't work too well. I remember a long time ago, there was, uh, they started this application online called Nextdoor. Some of you might know about mm -hmm. it now. And we started it. I was one of the founding people way back when, one of the neighborhoods here. And we thought it was great, right? Wow, all this knowledge, everybody can communicate. Once it got rolling, it was kind of like a Facebook. We're like, this is terrible. Like, we were living in ignorant bliss and just happy. And then everybody thought how terrible the neighborhoods were because they knew everything. They're like, 
man, there's break-ins everywhere, there's crime, there's this, and they had all this information they didn't have before. And they're like, wow, this is terrible. Like, it was a burden on you realizing all this was going on, where it wasn't a burden when you didn't know about it. Didn't know about it. Yeah. <laughs> so it was like, we wish that had never come about. Of course, that same app, I, I want to take people and strangle them every time somebody gets on there. Did anybody know a good plumber in Levine? I just want to, could you scroll back up? Scroll up. You're going to see that same question asked 32 times, and everybody's going to say, Chris the plumber. <laughs> and he is good. Um, but he asks this question and says, why, so why is he so negative? Why has his job been imposed on him by God? Well, first, he's challenging the wildly held idea that the pursuit of knowledge fulfills life and gives a person some sort of permanent significance. He's challenging that idea. You can get all the knowledge you want, and your permanence is uh, the same as the person who hasn't learned 2 plus 2 is 4. Harry, my Bible says, what a heavy burden God has laid on men. I keep going back to the uh, consequence of the original sin. You're going to work the ground and toil. Yes. There you go. That's your... And again, and again, and again. Instead of just walking through a garden going, hey, this looks good. <laughs> I still want the knowledge, and at the end of the day, now temporarily, I'm going to get a house out of it, I'm going to get a promotion to work, whatever. But the final, ultimate thing is nothing. Second, I think he finds this a hopeless task and he realizes he can't even find the final answers on his own. You can get all the knowledge and continue to learn and continue to find new things. And you realize, I still can't answer the big whys. Apart from God, of course. And third, he sees all of life then as under the sovereign rule of God. Yes. You know what? Somebody beyond me is in charge of this whole mess. Thank you. <laughs> the intellectuals and their work are as much under his authority as anyone else. 1 Corinthians 3.19 For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, since it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. The wisdom of this world, God says, yeah. Dummies. I can show you the new thing. I can show you the answers. But as long as you keep scratching in the dirt trying to figure it out on your own, you're just going to end up like Solomon. Going, I learn and I learn and I learn and I can't accomplish a single change to anything. In fact, he states that all work Solomon does, and the context here is intellectual work, all work is doomed to go away in the face of time and death. All of that intellectual knowledge is going to be lost with you. Hopefully you've taught some of it to your children. Hopefully. And hopefully they learn it. And hopefully they learn it. <laughs> and access it and deal with it. But how many of your children have learned the same life lessons that you did? Did you watch them go through it? None have learned the lessons. <laughs> you know, some, and some don't even learn the lesson then. They go, okay, I'll do it a little bit different. I'll do the same thing. I'll change up a little bit and I'll get a different result. The definition of insanity. Doing the same thing again and expecting a different result. The statement chasing after the wind means eating the wind. If you take it into a direct linguistic word for word, it means eating the wind. He said, going after this intellectual stuff is like eating the wind. Accomplish anything? If you face the wind, open your mouth. If you have your back to the wind, open your mouth. 
Yeah, the air blows past and it's gone. Something you can never actually catch and hold. Then he uses a, a, a proverb for illustration because he's a good teacher. So he uses an illustration. And a lot of linguistic experts believe that this was probably a proverb that was well known to his readers. That's in verse 15. That which is crooked cannot be made straight. And I lost the rest of it in my head. Oh, it's right in front of me. Duh. That which is lacking cannot be counted. That which is crooked refers to a problem that can't be solved. There are plenty of those in world, in our world right now. Problems that cannot be solved by man and his wisdom. The other part of that proverb is what is lacking cannot be counted. This refers to a lack of information. When I was on the community response squad, I dealt with strikes, protests, marches, race relations, all that sort of thing my squad did. And I would have to go before the chiefs and every once in a while I had to go before the mayor and the city council as they were, okay, you know, we need to cut some positions here. Why, why do we have this squad? Why do we have these officers doing that? And the big thing was, is you couldn't count anything at the end of the day for us. Now with police officers, what can you count? How many citations? How many arrests? How many, how many, how many, how many, how many? And what we told them is we went to work all day and because we worked all day and because we went to the strike and protest, nobody went to jail and nobody got a ticket. How do you count zero? <laughs> no cars got burned. No businesses got looted. We went to work all day and nothing happened. Well, yeah, but in a, in a society that wants to count, what you did as to show what you did so we understand why we you were paying you and Solomon says you know what the same thing here is when I don't have that information missing data can't be taken into account so that problem contributes towards that inability to find an answer here's things I don't know I can't count that in so I can't find an answer in the first place and now I have information that I don't even know that I don't know and I can't put that in so I'm that's it. Some problems just can't be solved. And some information we can't ever find. And we have to learn also to accept that. You know what? I can't solve that problem. But what part of me says, yes, I can? Right. Absolutely. I can too. Watch me. And by the time I'm done mucking this up, <laughs> I'll have taken a very small problem and made it into a really big one. And we can count it. Yeah, and I can count that. So the intellectual, more than anyone else, should be aware of the futility of the human position. The smarter you are, the more you realize that Solomon was accurate. No matter how he or she searches, the intellectual cannot answer some fundamental questions of life from a strictly human wisdom basis, because God's ways are unfathomable. In the last three verses, 16, 17, and 18, the teacher, Koholeth, looks, he goes completely the opposite. So now he's going to examine foolishness. Okay, I've examined wisdom. I've gone after it. I've learned everything that you can possibly learn. And everything that knew, I come in and I, I absorb that. And I realize, okay, let's go the opposite direction. Then. Let's look at foolishness. Or the pursuit of pleasure. Now we're going to see this a lot more fully developed next week in chapter 2. For now, he means that he examined the life of pleasure from a philosophical standpoint. But if you study Solomon's history, you realize he studied it up close and personal, yes, too. He, did. he didn't deny himself anything. 
including multiple wives and concubines and the best foods and places to live and everything else. He finds what we might refer to as, again, a welcome to college course, as Epicure Epicureanism, or Epicurus, one of the Greek philosophers who believed that the study of the, a life of pleasure, now his was intellectual pleasure more than hedonism, but a life of pleasure was, was the ultimate good. And Solomon says, you know what? That's unsatisfactory too. That doesn't work. He went in this direction, I think, because of his prior disappointment with the intellectual quest. Okay, the, the wisdom, the intellectual, the knowledge quest didn't take me to the final answer. And again, what is he really looking for? Same thing that we're all looking for, by the way. Peace. peace with God. He's looking for peace, but he's looking to control it. I want to get it on my terms. I want to be able to achieve it, control it, manipulate it, do the right things, and now I'm in control. Sound familiar? Yes. <laughs> and he said, that didn't work. All the knowledge in the world, and I still can't control the world. My world. The world at large. So I look at pleasure and foolishness. He wanted to learn the difference because often opposites illustrate each other. When I look at the opposite of one thing, it illustrates the other side, back and forth. That's still a scientific principle today. If I look at the opposite of a reaction, then that tells me something about something else. And he said, so I'm gonna look at this and learn about it from that way. But ultimately, he said, this too is a pursuit of the wind. I'm eating wind. I look at just going for pure pleasure, and that didn't make it either. For with much wisdom is much sorrow. As knowledge increases, grief increases. And the only reason that's true is because the knowledge doesn't take me to the new thing that the gospel gives me. It takes me back to the wise that I can't answer I want to close this morning with a, a quote from Matthew Henry. If you have any Bible study materials, Matthew Henry is one of the old school guys. And you need to start with a, a, a volume of Matthew Henry. There's a lot of new guys, there's a lot of new stuff, but everybody I know, every good Bible expositor, every good Bible student, and one of my very first Bible uh, stuff given to me as a senior in high school was Matthew Henry. He's just great. Some of it's dated because it was written a long time ago. But his thought and reasoning on things is just great. Here's how he summed up verses 12 through 18. And I'm going to do a cardinal error. I'm going to put it on the board for you to read and I'm going to read it to you. Solomon tried all things and found them vanity. He found his searches after knowledge weariness, not only to the flesh, but to the mind. The more he saw the works done under the sun, the more he saw their vanity and the sight often vexed his spirit. See, I told you he's old school. <laughs> he could neither gain that satisfaction to himself nor do that good to others, which he expected to be able to be done through knowledge and wisdom. Even the pursuit of knowledge and wisdom discovered man's wickedness and misery, so that the more he knew, the more he saw cause to lament and mourn. And here's Matthew Henry's summation. Let us learn to hate and fear sin. The cause of all this vanity and misery, to value Christ, to seek rest in the knowledge, love, and service of the Savior. Because that has eternal profit. I just realized from this that being dumb is a blessing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I heard an old axiom earlier this morning. Ignorance is bliss. 
And there's arguments against that as well, because then if I'm ignorant of the landmine in front of me, I step on it. <laughs> But then if but, you're saved, you can also knowledge is power. And then knowledge is power on the opposite side. But Solomon looked at both of them and said, we need a new thing. We need the gospel. Bill, would you close this morning? Thank you, Father. Thank you for staying on. Thank you. It's just another morning, beautiful morning, Lord, that we're able to come and serve you, Father. We thank you for this class, Lord, we just thank you for this Lord, upcoming lesson, Lord, in the next few minutes, Lord. I just pray that it speaks to our heart. Lord, I pray, pray that it just shows us one thing, Lord, that all we need is you. Lord, I just ask you, Lord, that you just will open our hearts to it, Lord. I just ask you, Lord, that you put your hand upon the service today, Lord. I just ask you, Father, that if there's anyone there that doesn't know you, Father, that they'll come to realize that they're not granted no matter something in this life, it doesn't matter who they are, how much knowledge they have, place them in anything of that sort, Father. All they need is you. Once again, Father, thank you for this body, Lord. Thank you for this class, and thank you for hearing I just thank you for, once again, another day to be able to come and serve you, Father. We thank you for all things in Jesus Christ's name. If you want to read ahead, Ecclesiastes chapter 2 for next week. Bring your questions.